CME Info's continuing education and board certification programs bring the conference to you. The following is a video sample from Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine's perioperative management course. This excerpt is from course director, Dr. Nader Faraday's lecture titled, Perioperative Myocardial Ischemia, Mechanisms and Preventive Strategies. So we'll talk about the pathophysiology of perioperative myocardial ischemia, and we'll talk about ways to both prevent and treat that ischemia in the context of the 2009 ACC AHA guidelines. Uh, and we'll speak specifically about a couple of therapies. We'll talk about beta blockers, we'll talk about statins, we'll talk about aspirin, and then we'll talk about some emerging data about uh, biomarkers and how we can use them for surveillance and potentially to guide therapy at the end. So I think everyone knows the scope of the problem is large. A lot of people have surgery. A lot of people have coronary disease. Uh, and if you put a lot of people who have, sur uh, who have coronary disease and put them through a stress period, some of them are going to have myocardial infarctions, and a few of those are actually going to wind up dying. And the pathophysiology uh, basis of myocardial ischemia, everyone knows, is essentially is imbalance of the supply and demand of oxygen to the heart. Uh, but there's been some debate over this topic about which of those problems is uh, more severe in perioperative patients. Is that there's too little supply, or is there too much demand? This has gone, over the past 20 years, I've been following this, into a kind of a new phase. If, if you look at the, the data, there has been a, a lot of thinking about hyperadrenergic stimulation, too much tachycardia, too much hypertension, too much demand on the heart, and that causes ischemia and then infarction. If you look at the medical literature, there's a different take, right? The, we know that myocardial infarctions are caused by a rupture of a plaque on a coronary artery that's shown here. So here's a coronary artery, a person, unfortunately, who died of a heart attack. Here's a plaque. It ruptured. And then you get this big clot sitting inside the coronary. Essentially, there's an a, a abrupt cessation of blood flow. It wasn't that there was too much demand. There just simply was not enough supply. And if you look at uh, the pathological specimens from patients who've had a perioperative MI, uh, these are pie charts looking at the pathology. Uh, from both types. On the left there are uh, fatal non-operative infarctions. On the right are fatal perioperative infarctions. The red is plaque hemorrhage. The yellow is plaque rupture. The blue is acute thrombus. And what you can see is the cho two charts look pretty much the same. So patients who wind up dying of infarctions uh, in the perioperative period do so, at least on a pathological basis, as far as we can tell, on the same way as those who die of infarctions in non-operative settings. So the data would suggest, then, that the perioperative infarctions probably have a similar pathophysiology as those that happen in the non after setting. This happens because of plaque rupture in most cases. Uh, and you should also know that this plaque rupture can occur in the setting of non-flow limiting disease, essentially 50% stenosis or less. That commonly occurs. And if this is the case, then we might imagine that the management of perioperative ischemia should be similar. Uh, certainly parallel to that in the non-operative settings. So how do we manage myocardial ischemia and prevent infarctions in the non-operative setting? Again, this is data everybody knows. In, in, in patients who have uh, chronic disease, uh, mainstays of therapy, of course, beta blockers, statins, antiplatelet agents and antihypertensive agents, all used commonly in those patients who have acute chest pain, we use nitroglycerin. And then in patients who have acute coronary syndromes, here we're talking about patients who have unstable disease, then we add additional agents. And these are generally aimed at preventing thrombus formation or treating thrombus formation. So we add heparin, thrombolytics. And in the, the more severe cases, we actually revascularize. We can't reopen the vessel, so we essentially will bypass that through surgery or we'll stick in a, a catheter and open up that vessel. And now if you look at what we do in the perioperative setting, what do we do? Well, we'll talk a lot about beta blockers in some detail. Statins, uh, uh, we don't have a clear answer, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But what we generally do is we hold antiplatelet agents because we're afraid patients are going to bleed. In a lot of cases, what we're doing is we're holding standard antihypertensive therapy, right? Well, don't give the ACE inhibitor. Don't give the diuretic for certain concerns, fluid balance or hypotension. We really can't give much nitroglycerin if chest pain does occur uh, because people do get hypotensive. And certainly, if the patient develops an acute coronary syndrome, heparin is oftentimes uh, off the table, at least in the operative setting itself, maybe several hours or a day or so after you could. But for many weeks, uh, four to six, you're not going to be using thrombolytics. So you can see, if you look at the two sides of this uh, uh, slide, that what we do perioperatively is very different from what we do in the non-operative setting, uh, even though it's our therapies are, are, are the, uh, the pathophysiology is, is probably quite similar. 
top quality board certification reviews, and continuing education programs, guaranteed. For more information about this self-study activity, go to www.cmeinfo.com slash 775V or call us at 1-800-284-8433.